Good morning and welcome everyone. It is so wonderful to have you here as we mark the 15th anniversary, 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement that brought an end to the troubles in Northern Ireland. We also want to celebrate the role of women in the peace process and the difference they made. The work of sustaining peace is never finished. And so we come together as well to focus on the work that must continue to go forward. I will never forget traveling to Belfast with President Clinton and the First Lady at Christmas time in 1995. The troubles had not ended. Security was high, but the longing for peace was in the air. Hillary met with a group of community-based women, both Catholics and Protestants, and over a cup of tea, they told her their experiences of the conflict. Many had lost husbands, sons, and brothers. They had come together to break the cycle of mistrust and to address their common problems. They wanted a better life for their children. The first trip was but the first of many to Northern Ireland, and the journey has never ended, and we are here again today. There were also visits to Washington, and on one visit during the peace talks, Hillary met at the White House with the two women negotiators of the Women's Coalition, and one of them, Monica McWilliams, is back here today. They told her what more needed to be done, what we could do to be helpful. And when the peace agreement was finally adopted, hundreds of women, many of whom had never come together across the divide, gathered at Waterfront Hall in Belfast, a gathering of the vital voices of Northern Ireland to advance political, economic, and social progress. It was but one tangible reflection of our enduring partnership. The Partnership for Peace, of course, also included the United Kingdom and Ireland. And we all come together in this program. Northern Ireland, despite all challenges to the peace over the years, despite the very serious challenges that extend to today, has been an example of inclusive peace building to the world. We have brought women from other conflict affected parts of the globe to learn from Northern Ireland's experience. And the women of Northern Ireland have also shared their experiences with women peace builders from Colombia to Ukraine. Monica, for example, just came back from South Sudan and that work continues around the world. Lessons shared about participation, inclusion, reconciliation, making politics work, and so much more. A few months ago, our Georgetown ambassadors, some of whom are here today, traveled to Northern Ireland. And among the many conversations with community groups, they met with some of the recently elected women. The election saw a wave of young women candidates from across the political spectrum. And today, women constitute 36% of the elected assembly members. So before we begin today's program, I especially want to welcome all of you who have traveled from Northern Ireland. We have so many with us and we're so delighted you're here from Ireland, from across the United States and other places. I want to acknowledge Ireland's indomitable ambassador to the United States, Geraldine Byrne Nason, and the United States ambassador to Ireland, Claire Cronin, along with the ambassador of Liechtenstein, who is here with us as well. I want to recognize the Washington Ireland program that has made such a difference. The Northern Ireland Bureau, the UK Embassy, and the Irish Embassy as well as officials from the State Department. Welcome to each and every one of you. It now, it 
It now gives me great pleasure to introduce the president of this university, Jack DeJoya, who has led this university with distinction academically, as well as in its strong commitment to public service, as exemplified in its credo, women and men for others. We are very grateful to him for his unstinting support for the work of our institute dedicated to advancing the role of women in peace building and for being with us today. Please welcome President DeJoya. Well, good morning, and it's a privilege to be with all of you this morning. Let me begin by expressing our deep gratitude to Ambassador Revere and her team at the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security for organizing such a rich gathering with this extraordinary group of speakers. We are honored to be gathered with so many colleagues deeply committed to inclusive peace building, and we're grateful to each one of them for sharing their experiences, perspectives, and insights related to the ongoing work to fulfill and uphold the Good Friday Agreement, now 25 years after its passage. We recognize the women leaders who have been at the forefront of this work, the role that consensus, coalition building, and inclusion played in enabling that pivotal moment in 1998, and the ongoing need to ensure the commitments of the agreement are fully realized. I'd especially like to recognize three women who have had a disproportionate impact on this work, Secretary Hillary Rodham Clinton, President Mary Robinson, and Monica McWilliams. Each has, <laughs> each has made extraordinary contributions to peace building and to including and elevating the voices of women in peace processes. We're grateful for their continuing engagement here at Georgetown for the leadership that they have demonstrated and for the opportunities they have created for other leaders to continue this important work. This is a gathering that has great significance to us at Georgetown. We have deep connections to colleagues and institutions in Ireland and the UK. We've enjoyed a long and deep relationship with Queen's University Belfast through academic partnerships and exchanges. We have a global Irish studies initiative led by Professor Colleen Parsons here at Georgetown. And we have the work of the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security, which has been engaged with many of our colleagues here today in promoting the work of women leaders and in inclusive peace in Northern Ireland. We recognize there's important work ahead, a continuing call to realize the full promise of the Good Friday Agreement, especially on issues related to equity and representation, as well as the emergence of new challenges with the departure of the United Kingdom from the European Union. This morning, to begin our program, I have the privilege of introducing the Prime Minister of Ireland, Leo Varadkar. As Taoiseach, he has been at the forefront of addressing these challenges, including through the most recent proposal of a new framework for trade between Northern Ireland, the EU, and the UK. He has served as Taoiseach since December of 2022, having previously served in this role from 2017 to 2020. He began his career as a medical doctor before joining the Fine Gael party and taking on several ministerial roles in the government of Ireland. Tomorrow, he will be spending time with President Biden at the White House in recognition of the strong relationship between our two nations. We are honored by his presence here at Georgetown this morning. So please join me in welcoming to the podium Taoiseach of Ireland, Leo Varadkar. Thank you very much, everyone, and uh, good morning, and thank you, President DeJoya, uh, Secretary Clinton, Ambassador Revere, uh, thank you for the very warm welcome uh, and for the invitation to be here with you to mark 25 years of the Good Friday Agreement and particularly to do with, with, with the many women here who were integral to peace on the island of Ireland. 
I'm pleased to be joined uh, here today um, by some uh, elected colleagues from Ireland, uh, Michelle O'Neill, MLA, who's Vice President of Sinn Féin, um, Little Pengeli, MLA uh, from the DUP, uh, and of course, uh, our great former President, Mary Robinson, who's here uh, as well. Because of the Good Friday Agreement, which occurred 25 years ago, uh, Ireland was able to overcome history and to create a new future together. I remember well, I was 18 or 19 years old at the time. It was the first time that I was able to vote uh, and voted in a referendum, both North and South, in very large majorities uh, for a different future. And it has been a different and better future since then, notwithstanding the challenges that we have. And I think 25 years on, it shines as a beacon of hope and an example to all of us in politics and outside of politics that the impossible can be achieved when people work together to build a sustainable future and a better, to build sustainable peace and a better future for the next generations. It ended a cycle of violence and retaliation. It gave people the freedom to live their lives and to dream once again. And we are a very different Ireland and a much better Ireland because of it. And there is still much more to do. I think the great success of the agreement is that it helped to heal decades of violence and prejudice. But unfortunately, as we know, other forms of prejudice survived and endured, and new ones emerged. The central role of women in the peace process was visible to everyone involved at the time. Women were there at its formal and informal genesis. Women played a leading role at the political top tables in Belfast, London, and Dublin, and in Washington and provided voices in civil society, which shaped the context in which peace became possible. And very often, women picked up the pieces when things fell apart and moved forward when others tried to drag us back. And yet, some of these contributions went unrecognized at the time and in many ways are unrecognized today. As Bernadette Devlin McCallisky said, the real problem in our history was not that women were written out of Irish history, it's that they were never written into it in the first place. In truth, women from across the political spectrum were able to contribute to everything that happened, except it seems the photographs at the end. And I believe therefore, we can have no meaningful commemoration of the Good Friday Agreement unless the rule of, role of women is properly recognized and applauded. International studies have confirmed what we've learned in Ireland, that the greater participation of women in peace building increases the likelihood that any agreement that's reached will, will last and be sustained. And the Good Friday Agreement is testament to that. Women in Northern Ireland earned their seats at the table through determination and through talent, rising against the odds, engaging in the democratic process. Women like Breed Rogers, for example, of the SDLP, who was the first female chairperson of any political party in Ireland. The work of the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition, co-founded by Dr. Monica McWilliams, who is here today, working with the late May Blood and many more, was critical in influencing the final agreement, including the important language in the agreement on matters such as housing, education, victims, and reconciliation, all essential components of peace building then and now. By standing up, and speaking out, they change the history of Ireland forever. And I think in many ways, uh, the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition is something worthy of study in its own right. It was a political party, uh, one of 10 that was involved in the Good Friday Agreement negotiations, uh, made up of women from Catholic and Protestant backgrounds. It was non-sectarian and centre ground, um, almost unique in our history and probably not common in history around the world. And I often wonder where we would be today if the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition was represented uh, in the Northern Ireland Assembly. On behalf of a grateful nation, I want to extend my thanks to Liz O'Donnell, who's also here. Uh, she was a minister in the Department of Foreign Affairs and represented the government of Ireland at the negotiation table. Over a sustained period of intense and difficult work, she was instrumental in encouraging people to the table and persuading them to stay the course. And I'm glad to say that when um, at least part of the Good Friday Agreement was signed in Dublin, um, Minister O'Donnell was in the photograph, uh, albeit in the second row. <laughs> um, 
We also pay tribute, of course, to the late Mo Molum, who all of us remember so fondly, in helping to negotiate the agreement. Uh, she touched people's lives in a way that's difficult to explain. As one academic said, she changed the weather, altered the atmosphere, and got people to trust her. Uh, there really w hasn't been anyone like her since. Uh, she was a unique person, I think, uh, in, in, in political life. So because all of them and others, today's event really matters. It's the story of women at the helm. And it's not a story that's separate from the peace process. It's an integral part of it, a part which shines a light on more uncomfortable aspects of society and our attitudes. I'd also like to remember a remarkable woman by the name of Joyce McCartan. She was a Protestant from Northern Ireland who married a Catholic and heard the shots that killed her youngest son in their own home. Afterwards, she was driven by a desire to move beyond the pain and suffering that her family had endured. She believed in forgiveness, one of the most, hor most, one of the most difficult things, I think, for someone who's been bereaved in that way uh, to embrace. And she established the Lamplighter Drop-In Center where people could talk and mingle and find some ease from their pain. And indeed, in 1995, it was visited by your then First Lady. Secretary Clinton, you helped to make the peace in Northern Ireland. And Ireland, in turn, helped inspire you as you applied the lessons of that peace process to other conflicts around the world in the work that you did subsequently. That visit was influential because it offered tangible evidence for how the wrongs of the past can be forgiven and how peace and reconciliation can finally be achieved. It reminds us that although the Good Friday Agreement belongs to the women and men in Ireland, and especially in Northern Ireland, it was also co-produced here in America. And I often feel that the United States is the third co-guarantor co of that agreement. And so we owe an enormous debt of gratitude to our American friends and partners. And particularly Secretary Clinton, thank you for being such a dedicated advocate for Northern Ireland, for your con continued interest in Northern Ireland. And of course, the role that you continue to fulfill through your chancellorship of Queen's University in Belfast. So over the past 25 years, the United States played a central role in helping to implement the peace process, providing assistance at critical junctures. The Irish peace process is one of the greatest success stories of American foreign policy. And it was achieved by administrations from both sides of the aisle over the past three decades. And your ongoing friendship is essential as we continue to protect, nurture, and grow the achievements and the benefits and commitments of the Good Friday Agreement. And particularly for the younger members of the audience here, for the students here, uh, I know that American foreign policy gets criticized a lot, um, and rightly so, by the way. America doesn't get everything right. Um, but I'm sure that if you take the great sweep of history, uh, America has been a force for good in the world. Has set, um, has set an enormous example as to what's possible uh, if you believe in democracy, if you believe in the rule of law, if you believe in free enterprise, uh, if you believe in equality for women and people from LGBT backgrounds such as me. The big changes that happened that changed our world uh, often started uh, here in America. And, um, All I would finally say to the younger people here, um, please stay the course with us and please continue to have an interest in Ireland because it does make a difference and is a positive influence for us uh, in the past and I know will be into the future. So we also know that where political institutions are not functioning, it's often women who feel the negative social and economic effects the deepest. Women's leadership, vision and inspiration is needed today more so than ever to ensure that Northern Ireland and all of Ireland achieves its full potential. It means in particular making space for our young leaders, women as well as men, to take the helm. This is their time to promote peace and prosperity for the people in Northern Ireland and Ireland as a whole. 
as we look forward to the next 25 years and beyond. In Ireland, as is the case around the world, too many women live in fear of violence. And we know too many examples of women who live in the shadow of domestic violence or who suffer from random or targeted acts of aggression. And even in the greatest of countries, too many girls and boys live in fear of gun violence where even a school is not a safe place. That must stop, and I believe it can stop. <laughs> and so we need to recommit ourselves to a new vision of freedom, one that gives all women and all men the freedom to live their own lives, to be able to laugh and love and dream their own dreams without fear or consequence. That's very much my dream. I know it's one that we all share here today. And let that be our message this year. So, Gurmil Mahagav Galer, Agus Law, Ela Padrig, Honadiv. So, thank you all very much. And one day in advance, happy St. Patrick's Day. Well, thank you, Tishak, for that just extraordinary lesson about the role that women have played in Northern Ireland, of course, but also the women from Ireland, the UK, and the United States. Uh, we are so grateful that he could come by this morning. Uh, we now uh, want to welcome the United States Consul General in Belfast, Paul Narain. He is a career diplomat and has been providing distinguished service since he arrived in Belfast in August of 2021. Paul? Uh, thank you, Ambassador. President DeJoya, thank you so much. Distinguished guests, friends, Secretary Clinton, it's great to see you. It's a real honor for me to be here this morning. When I look around this room, I see so many familiar faces right here. You might forgive me if I thought I hadn't left Belfast. I can't thank the university enough for convening women leaders from Northern Ireland and beyond who have dedicated their lives and careers to the betterment of others. You probably know this already, but St. Patrick events in Washington are part of a special tradition that dates back to 1952. And as we edge to the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, some of you will reflect on how much the annual exodus to our nation's capital has provided space for negotiation and for dialogue. Our open doors were a manifestation of the deep and long-standing affinity that we have for the people of Northern Ireland. I experienced this dynamic especially 12 years ago before I took up this post. In 2009, I worked as the lead advance for Secretary of State Hillary Clinton on her first visit to Northern Ireland as the Secretary of State. I remember distinctly her remarks at City Hall, which focused on the role of women as mothers, sisters, daughters, and leaders. She also spoke then at length about the role of women as trailblazers in the peace process. My former boss could speak with real authority in this area, she and Ambassador Revere were co-founders of Vital Voices, a partnership that has worked hard worldwide to empower some of the leaders who are in this room today. Their movement was founded on the premise that nations and communities cannot move forward without women's voices in leadership. And Northern Ireland became living proof of that. At a political level, yeah. At a political level, the Northern Ireland Assembly once had the lowest proportion of female representation among the UK's devolved administrations. But by 2020, a third of the region's assembly seats were held by women, and still a ways to go. In my daily work, I speak regularly with two women party leaders, as well as countless female MLAs and party, and party members of the absolute highest caliber, whose decisions, values, and viewpoints will shape the future of Northern Ireland. The civil service is headed by an exceptional female leader, 
she's sitting right here, providing policy direction under difficult and challenging circumstances. And I am really delighted that Jane Brady can join us today. Please join me in a round of applause. Every milestone provides an opportunity to draw breath and acknowledge progress. Next month's Good Friday Agreement commemorations in Belfast will be no different. Queen's University de deserves great credit, tremendous credit, in making sure that the role of women as drivers of that peace and of our progress are not written out of history, but written to the heart of it. Next month's anniversary will also prompt us to look forward. In a roundtable just last week, virtually in Belfast, our new Special Envoy for Economic Affairs, Joe Kennedy, asked Northern Ireland business leaders about the next 25 years and what it should look like. A resounding response was that it was inclusivity. By that, they meant that Northern Ireland's potential will only be achieved if every section of society has a stake in being a part of it. From boardrooms to innovation spaces, Diversity is strength, whether it is in the United States or Northern Ireland. A few months before her passing, I had the great privilege of meeting the Baroness Mayblood in an integrated primary school. Her legacy as a trade unionist, as a civil rights leader, was really matched by her fervent belief in the removal of barriers around education. Baroness Blood's activism right up to her death was a recognition that Northern Ireland still had unfinished business. And to that end, I want to thank the university today for providing a valuable forum for that unfinished business, that positive discourse. The collective ability of the people in this room affirms my belief that Northern Ireland has no limit as to what it can achieve if society holds together. It will also continue to inspire many other parts of the world and we will be there, right there with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Consul General. You know, the Taoiseach mentioned Mo Molum. She was the UK's secretary to Northern Ireland at the critical moments in the peace process. And I think all of us who were privileged to work with her will never forget her, but particularly history will never forget the role that she played. And so it is so wonderful now representing the United Kingdom to have with us, welcoming her back to Georgetown, Her Excellency Dame Karen Pierce, the ambassador, is just extraordinarily energetic in all that she undertakes, and it is so fitting that she join us for this program today. Welcome, Ambassador Pierce. Uh, well, thank you very much to Ambassador Bavir for having me today. Madam Secretary, uh, Special Envoy, uh, friends and colleagues, it is a true honor to be able to be part of this very important uh, event. Uh, I have two personal uh, claims, if you like, to be at an event uh, that celebrates the island of, of Ireland. Uh, my mother's cousin was an Irish international soccer player, uh, and I was here in the British Embassy 30 years ago when President Clinton and Secretary Clinton took some groundbreaking and decisive moves to help pave the path to peace that the Blair government uh, then was able to turn into with, with the help, of course, of Ireland, uh, all the parties in Northern Ireland and the United States turn into the, the Good Friday uh, agreement and I, I remember those moments very well and they weren't always comfortable uh, but they were always moving in the right direction and it was the right thing to do so may I add my voice as well uh, to Secretary Clinton and President Clinton uh, and thank you very much to you and the Taoiseach Ambassador Bavir for that wonderful tribute to Mo Molum. She was a force uh, of nature. Uh, she may have done more than any other single uh, politician to, in, in the UK to, to bring uh, 
uh, about the Good Friday Agreement and to bring about reconciliation uh, and peace and stability uh, in this wonderful part of the world. Uh, as we heard from the Taoiseach, history is often told from the perspective of mostly male political and diplomatic leaders. Uh, they make the final policy decisions. The Taoiseach referred to the photographs. Uh, we rarely hear the stories of women who play the key role in organizing and maintaining communities, because without that, peace cannot be made. Peace cannot flourish and peace certainly cannot be sustained. And it was women who throughout the decades of violence in Northern Ireland kept their families fed, kept them intact. They faced the burdens of poverty, domestic violence, single parenthood, even loss of housing because of the conflict. Uh, so may I thank all the women uh, in the room for their incomparable leadership and commitment to building and maintaining peace in Northern Ireland. It's truly an honor to be here with you. Um, it's also an enormous honor to be here with President Robinson as well as Secretary Clinton, two of my heroes. Uh, I've seen your work uh, at the UN. Uh, I think what Ambassador Vivir said about Northern Ireland being a model and a guide in peace processes is spot on. And I think every day Secretary Clinton and President Robinson, who was the first Irish head of state to visit the United Kingdom, uh, exemplify that. We've heard a lot about how the Good Friday Agreement uh, came about, so I will, I will not repeat that. Uh, what I did want to do is look, look to the future. Uh, the 25th anniversary is very much about looking to the next 25 years and beyond as much as this is about marking the incredible achievement of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Uh, our commitment, the British government's commitment to the Good Friday Agreement is unshakable. I just want to put that on the record. And it always will be uh, unshakable. And to that end, uh, Rishi Sunak, the new Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, uh, has negotiated a, an agreement with the European Union, with colleagues uh, in the European Union, uh, called the Windsor Framework. And it resolves the outstanding trade issues uh, between Northern Ireland, uh, the mainland, and the European Union, and Ireland. And this is, this is a great uh, achievement on both sides, if I may say so. Uh, but I think more than that, it's fantastic that it comes at this time. It really does enable us to chart an ambitious and inspirational and exciting path uh, for Northern Ireland's prosperity as well as for its security. Uh, Northern Ireland is, is seen as an integral part through the Windsor framework uh, of the United Kingdom uh, internal market. It also has access to the EU single market. That is a unique uh, place to be. That is something that we must absolutely help Northern Ireland make the most of. Uh, it has such a talented youth. It has such committed people. It has so many good economic things going for it. We'll hear from the special uh, envoy later, and he'll, he'll be able to talk in detail uh, about that. But um, really, the next 25 years uh, for Northern Ireland are bright and they're prosperous, and I think we can all look forward to helping them on that journey. Thank you. We are now going to uh, turn our panel on women forging peace, and thank you so much, Ambassador Pierce, for your remarks. Stories now from the Good Friday peace process and looking forward. And as I call your names, I hope you will come up to the stage and take a seat. So to help grapple with this topic this morning, we have four absolutely remarkable women leaders. First, Monica McWilliams, the co-founder of the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition and a lead negotiator Ooh. a lead negotiator in the Good Friday talks and a signatory to the agreement, one of two women at the table. The Honorable Mary Robinson, former president of Ireland.
and currently the chair of the elders, a group of global leaders working for peace, justice, and human rights worldwide. She never stops. Michelle O'Neill, the first minister-elect of Northern Ireland. and the deputy leader of Sinn Féin. And Liz O'Donnell, the former Minister of State of Ireland and a key member of the Irish government's negotiating team. So I will begin with you, Monica. No surprise at that. So as one of the two female negotiators at the table, tell us what difference it made uh, to have the women's coalition there with the other political parties, what kind of obstacles you confronted, and what it means uh, for the future as well. Just a wide open question but you can't take all day. Yeah. <laughs> and as anybody who knows me, I can't say hello in five minutes. Uh, but thank you, Milan. And first, I want to thank you. This event would have been impossible 25 years ago. We couldn't even stand in a photograph together 25 years ago. And look where we are now. Um, so thank you so much. Um, 25 years ago, we took a risk, and my good friend Avla Kilmurray, who's sitting there, said to me, let's go out for a cup of tea and talk about whether or not we should get involved in the peace talks. We had the ceasefires, and suddenly this moment, this constitutional moment came in our history of multi-party peace negotiations. So we said, we did the maths. I keep on saying, I'd love to say it was a cup of tea, but it was actually a bottle of wine. <laughs> And we had a bit of a vision, and we said, right, let's get organized. But it was really only to kind of put it up to the other parties. Are you going to have some women at the table? Well, they didn't even bother answering our letters. So we said, you know what? We'll get organized and do it ourselves. We had six weeks, Milan. We did it. And we always say that when you sit down at a peace talks table, it's normally the armed groups or the constitutional parties who've been there forever. And I don't want to take away from those two groups, because they all have to be there, the combatants and the politicians, if you're going to make peace. But it was one of those moments where we said, we didn't come out of nowhere, when parties said to us, did you fall out of the sky or something? And we said, we've been around for 25 years, and now get ready, get prepared, and we did it within six weeks. I'm not sure that I would uh, design that poster today that said, Good, wave goodbye to dinosaurs. <laughs> It wasn't actually the most appropriate if you want to make friends with the other people around the table. Um, but we did it, and it was a baptism of fire. Um, it was 25 years ago. We had an insult of the week notice board, and we were told to go home and breed for Ulster um, and to be proper housewives. Uh, so we sang the Dolly Parton song, Stand By Your Man, um, <laughs> and that was the start. So again... The lesson from that is an inclusive process. And 25 years later, look at us now. We actually know what inclusion means. Because if you leave people out in the cold, and that's not just those that were involved in the war or in the long-standing political conflict, it also meant women who had been out in the cold for so long. So thank you, Milan, for making this a very warm place. And today is quite emotional for me in many ways because we would have been somewhere down there at the back looking on, never mind not even being in the picture. Um, and today I want to pay tribute to the young emerging leaders who are here, Washington Ireland Programme, um, those who have been brought together through the International Fund for Ireland, the enormous amount of European Union funds that have helped build women, peace and security, and the Ireland funds. I want one minute to hear about the Taoiseach. He was 19. So... For those of you in Northern Ireland who are here today, who were teenagers, the day that we signed the peace agreement, just put up your hands, because then the, this audience will see 
just, there's Emma putting hers up. That's great. Because last night I met Connor Houston and he told me he was 15. That made me feel old. <laughs> <laughs> but it is wonderful that that new generation of emerging leaders. So that's the first thing, Milan, we put into the peace agreement. What are we going to do for the next generation? That's the value added that women bring to the table. May Blood is now passed on. She died before Christmas. Wonderful woman in our coalition. I want to pay tribute to her for knowing that children need to learn together, to share together. And she was tireless in pushing integrated education. We put that into the peace agreement. It's an unfinished business. We put the Civic Forum to bring business leaders who have meant so much recently in our discussions around Brexit. Trade union leaders, women's leaders, community leaders, we put that into the peace agreement. It's an unfinished business. And the most important and one I was really proud of, back in 1998, two years before Women, Peace and Security, the right of women to full and equal political participation. So we have 35% of women now in our new assembly. So that's good. But let's keep at that. It's an unfinished business. That needs to go into a new implementation committee that we need to set up when we go home to address the unfinished pieces of the Good Friday Agreement. I was the Chief Commissioner of the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission. I had no idea that I would take up that post after the Good Friday Agreement. It was written in. It's one of the functioning institutions. When people say the institutions need to get back up and running, there are institutions up and running and led by women, the police ombudsman, the Human Rights Commission, the Equality Commission, the Criminal Justice Inspectorate, all women, women at the helm. But Secretary Clinton, I remember words that you said at Beijing, women's rights are human rights. And there's not a day goes past in Northern Ireland that I remind people that if we ever do get a Bill of Rights, women's rights are human rights. So I want to pay tribute to you too. We are in the cusp of a new era and we're crafting tools that we could never have dreamed of for our, our children. There are people alive today that would not have been alive had we not made that Good Friday Agreement. But peace is just more than the ending of violence. It's sustainable peace. So I'll end by thanking Milan, my dear, dear friend, who I'm truly, truly grateful for, who heads up Women, Peace and Security here, who came back time and time again to Northern Ireland, as did you, Secretary Clinton and to Martha Pope, uh, George Mitchell's Chief of Staff. I remember that the Reverend Ian Paisley Sr. said she was the only Pope he ever liked. <laughs> and so, again, a tribute to a magnificent woman, um, and I hope she will stay in the picture like Mo Molum um, and never become a footnote. Um, so thank you so much to all of you. We were truly blessed to have women on this side of the Atlantic help us, and good men too. And may that long last for us. Thank you. Extraordinary groundbreaking work, um, Monica. And we know it wasn't easy. Uh, there was really difficult times, but just look at the progress to today. And thank you for mentioning the unfinished business. Let's turn now to the former president of Ireland. Mary, you were um, in office as the process was going forward. You made a real effort uh, to go up to Northern Ireland to be engaged. Tell us about that experience, why you did that, and how you saw the peace process going forward. Okay, thank you, Milan. It's wonderful to be back here in Georgetown University for this very special event. And I'd like to begin just by paying tribute uh, to you, Milan, and to Secretary Hillary Clinton for the enormous contribution you made, and Monica um, for your um, leadership, etc. But actually, um, I'm not going to be mentioning um, well-known names from now on, or well, maybe one or two, because I'm actually going to be mentioning the real sort of women on the ground that I met. Please. And it started um, with a, a real sense when I was elected the first woman president of Ireland that I needed to reach out. And I knew that my role as president was outside politics. So one of the ways of reaching out was to reach out to the women. And so in my inauguration address, I said, and I'm, I'm quoting a little bit, um, that Northern Ireland was a place close to my heart. 
And I said, and I'm quoting directly, I said, I wanted to extend the hand of friendship and of love to both communities in Northern Ireland. Now, that was a very unusual word, um, actually, to say love. I mean, I feel quite emotional at the moment. You shouldn't have used the word emotion, Monica. You're going to set me <laughs> off, you know. But um, so, you know, from the beginning, um, I was trying to see how outside politics it's possible to play some kind of a role. And we decided that we would invite um, a significant number of women's organizations down to my residence in Dublin, um, Oros on Uchtheron, the home of the president. So um, in early, the first half of 1991, I was elected, I, I, my inauguration was in December 1990. So just a few months later, um, we got a group with the support of the Women's Support Network, um, uh, I think in particular of Ines McCormick and May Blood. Um, Ines McCormick, who um, is AKA Meryl Streep now, you know, because uh, <laughs> Meryl acted her, and May Blood, who was so wonderful, and Avila Kilmurray, who will be speaking later. Um, uh, um, these were the, the ones who helped. But who came? Um, the, the groups included the Falls Women's Centre, the Twinbrook Polygrass Women's Centre, the Shankill Women's Centre, the Windsor Women's Centre, the Ballybean Women's Centre, the Willisburn Women's Centre, and the Downtown Women's Centre. And um, most of these were, um, they were working class women's groups and um, from both um, loyalist and Republican areas and um, uh, um, a downtown, of course, was a city centre area. And they were very keen to be inclusive, that I remember. And so they had um, the Women's Information Group, they had the Cara Friend Helpline, which is LGBTI, um, they had uh, the Northern Ireland Council of Ethnic Minorities, the Disability Action, and Derry Women's Centre. Now, what happened was, um, these women were dolled up to the 99s. Most of them had never been in Dublin before, and here they were coming to this residence in the park, in the Phoenix Park, to meet the president. And it was incredible. I mean, the makeup and the... Uh, and we all ended up sitting on the floor eventually and, and, and laughing a lot. But also, you know, they... And then the next stage was, um, I was clearly invited to go to Northern Ireland. And you remember this, Monica. <laughs> um, it, it, no president from Ireland had gone, um, so it was new. Um, and <laughs> um, it, it happened on the 4th of February, 1992. And there was a lot of tension. Uh, uh, you know, there was an attempt to vet the women that I would meet. Yeah, and uh, well, that was, yeah, exactly, yeah. And um, uh, again, um, it was Inez, it was you, it was Avila, it was uh, May Blood um, helping. And then we had to have a safe venue. And I remember the, head, the then head of the Equal Opportunities Commission, Mary uh, Clark Glass, um, uh, provided us, offered um, the venue. And um, Monica was reminding me this morning, um, everybody was in a circle because there were about 100 women there and I had to meet them. And I've seen that, you know, um, royalty does this, but this is the first time I was doing this kind of going from going from group to group to meet, etc. Um, and then um, you know this continued, and probably the uh, visit to Northern Ireland uh, that stays with me most was the hardest one. Um, I had got an invitation from six local organisations at this stage to come to Republican West Belfast. The Irish government didn't want me to go. The British government certainly didn't want me to go. Um, it was really hard, but nobody would say no because I was, you know, I had my own. <laughs> and um, the, the reason that the British and Irish government were so against it was that I would meet local politicians, including, of course, Jerry Adams. And um, so um, I still remember vividly arriving at the Falls Community Centre, um, the children outside with their flags, um, the, 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 the sense of excitement of a community that was being recognized at last. It was as much as that. You know, the, um, it, it, just, it was just incredible. And uh, there was music, first of all. And then I did meet the politicians, and it had been worked out that I would meet them in a corridor. So I met um, SDLP et cetera, and um, Jerry Adams um, in a corridor with no photographs. And there were very funny cartoons afterwards of handshakes, you know. Um, <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, but, but there was a lot of tension. And um, uh, I, um, I, I was very criticized by some of our national newspapers, et cetera. I mean, it was a real moment of thing. But the following morning, I was due to do another event, um, not in um, um, 
uh, Belfast itself, I can't now remember exactly where, it was just my normal visiting uh, um, uh, uh, center. <laughs> so I did my usual, got up, washed my hair, and waited for the hairdresser. But the hairdresser was a loyalist supporter, and there was no way she was doing the hair of that one <laughs> that went to the Falls Community Centre. <laughs> and I, I didn't have any, any equipment to help myself, so I, I went in my ragged best to the um, centre and you know, I was aware that I wasn't looking as presidential as usual, as they say. But anyway, um, but the interesting thing is, I had a driver, I remember his first name was Henry, and he, I was going to do a press conference at Belfast Airport before flying back to Dublin. And he arranged for a hairdresser at the airport so that before the press conference, I would look presidential. And it really mattered because it was a very edgy press conference. And I was getting more criticism almost from the Republic than from the Northern Ireland. You know, it, was, it was very, very, very hot stuff, as they say. And, um, uh, you know, this gave me a sense of what was really happening. And let us never forget, it was the women who came out from the housing estates and met each other. The men wouldn't do that. Um, the women wanted to stop the knee capping and the fighting, etc. And they, you know, and I, that's where I think, you know, of, of people like May Blood and, um, and, and Agnes McCormick, um, just being extraordinarily uh, brave, but also, um, you know, really wanting any visit that I made um, to be um, what it was, which was recognizing the role of women and trying to keep out of the politics, um, which was its own um, test of things. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I know how hard it was for you, Monica and Liz, um, to be at the table um, for the negotiations. I know how hard Inez in particular worked to get the human rights language in. Um, this was her passion. Um, and she has her participation in rights movement before she died in 2013, I think. Still going strong. Uh, still going strong. And uh, you know, that was a really important uh, dimension. So I could go on because I, um, I, I have such incredible memories, but it was the, um, it was the excitement of the dolled up, um, you know, coming to visit, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, in Dublin, et cetera. And then, uh, when you, oh yes, the Windsor uh, Center. Uh, that was a center in a loyalist area that I visited, and two days later it was burned, and I gather it was burned several times. Yeah, um, so because of the visit, yeah. So I mean, it was, uh, there were prices to be paid for what happened, but um, uh, to me, uh, you know, there would not have been a peace process leading to the Good Friday Agreement. I was in touch with John Hume. I saw an early copy of his draft, handwritten draft, of what he wanted to achieve in the, in the Good Friday Agreement, but not, it would not have happened without the women. So thank you, Milan, for having this wonderful way of celebrating the role of women. So Mary, I'll always think of Henry and the good men who were also involved. <laughs> Save the day for you. Uh, we're going to turn now to Liz O'Donnell. Liz, you were really a bridge builder in the negotiations. And the Taoiseach said you did make at least one of the photos, uh, but you played an indispensable role behind the scenes. Can you give us some sense of what that was like? Well, thank you, Milan. Um, first of all, it's a privilege to be here, and it was a privilege to be involved in the negotiations 25 years ago. Um, listening to President Robinson, I remember, I remember how I was inspired to actually get involved in politics was um, Mary was a lecturer in Trinity where I was studying law. And then I, when my children were very small, small babies, I ran, um, I, 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 I helped Mary in her election campaign as the first president, woman president of Ireland. And I was just a volunteer. And then when she was elected, um, it kind of mobilized Manon Heron uh, the women of Ireland, uh, to, to be empowered for the first time, including myself. And I went in to listen to her. She was addressing joint houses of the Oireachtas. And there was just a small smattering. I think there were only 10 women in the doll. I couldn't get over it. I said, this has to change. And I decided to get involved in politics then. So I think that's an important factor in terms of bridge building, is that women build bridges for other women and bring wo other women into, into political and public life. Uh, and I've kept up that relationship with Monica uh, and with the women I met, like, well, Mo, of course, we were all so close to Mo. But we were building relationships because, and br building bridges because 
the parties in Northern Ireland, whereas they were brilliant at expressing their own perspective and their own grievances and their own, their own kind of wishes for the future and their own fixed positions, but they weren't very good at putting themselves in the, in the shoes of the other person, of their enemies. And so that was the big challenge for us, was to have an inclusive process which um, meant that people got to know each other and build relationships with each other. And if you're actually spending an intense period of time together, talking together, talking and not being interrupted because our brilliant chair, George Mitchell, um, let people talk. He just let people talk. And through le listening to the other side, people got an awareness of their grievances, their perspectives. And of course, the women then brought in the perspectives of civil society because they didn't come from the tribes. They didn't come with fixed positions. They came with a different language. They came with different mix of skills. They came from the professions. They came from academia. They came from, um, there were social workers, academics. Um, they, were, they had been there for, as Monica said, 25 years. They'd been living through the conflict. And they had the experience of, and the pain and the trauma of living through the conflict. And they bought a different language. And they allowed us to move from fixed positions, everybody. We all had to move from fixed positions. The two governments had to move from fixed positions. And Mo Molan was ready to move. I believe she was, God rest her, she was the first Secretary of State of Northern Ireland who actually listened to and heard the grievance of the nationalist community. And that went to the heart of the conflict. And once that was heard and listened to, she was incredibly important in building confidence and empowerment of the nationalist negotiators there. Uh, so then, of course, we had the relationship with the unionist community. A huge cohort of the unionist community was not represented at the talks, uh, that was the DUP. So we had to support and we had to mind um, David Trimble, who was the, he was representing the Ulster Unionist Party and, and the loyalists were there, but he was on his own and he was politically expo exposed because outside the gates of uh, the talks, the DUP were criticizing him. He was under huge pressure. So relationships are really important. And that's why the fact that the, the, the institutions in Northern Ireland aren't sitting, they're not building up those important relationships that you gain through just knowing each other, having lunch together, getting to know each other and know each other's families. So my big wish at this important time of the 25th anniversary is that those really important power sharing institutions which will allow people to work together in peace and prosperity will be up and running soon because that was the great wish um, of the, the, late, the late John Hume and Seamus Mallon of above all, above all the constitutional issues, they just wanted the people of Northern Ireland to work together in peace and prosperity. And the great promise of the Good Friday Agreement will not be achieved unless all of the bits of it come together because it's all mutually interdependent. So thank you for inviting me here today, Milan, um, and everybody here, and Monica for your friendship, and you for your leadership, President Robson, and Michelle for your future leadership of Northern Ireland, for all of the people of Northern Ireland. That's something we all look forward to, and our precious peace. Thank you. So thank you for that, Liz, because you are once again the, the bridge builder on this panel, uh, talking about where we are today and where we need to go. And Michelle, you are the first minister-elect. Uh, you are in that very big leadership position. Um, and the challenges continue. And I wonder um, how you think about politics, using politics uh, in a positive way, develop those relationships, uh, to bring to the kind of conclusion everybody wants to see. Thank you so much, and I'm absolutely delighted to be on a panel with such formidable women, women who've also influenced my life and my outlook in terms of how I conduct myself in, in my job. Like, I was 20 when the Good Friday Agreement was signed, and I saw your faces all on the TV, and I was impressed by the women that's turned up every day and tried to make a difference. And we were reflecting earlier, and Liz made the point about um, being part of Mary's presidential campaign, and what that meant to women on the island of Ireland was just immense. But that inspired you to get involved in politics, and the role that women played in 1998 inspires me to be involved in politics. And when I went in to vote in the referendum, I never thought for a second that I'd be sitting on, the, on this platform in Georgetown, being the first minister-elect, and hopefully getting the chance to go actually go in and to lead in the Assembly. Because I believe that um, the point about 
we get so much more done in life when we work together. Um, you know, none of us are an island. None of us have, you know, the ability to, to work on solos. I think that it's much, much more effective if we can work together. So my determination as someone who I think represents the Good Friday Agreement generation, um, someone who from 1998, I have worked the Good Friday Agreement faithfully, someone who worked in the back room. Um, as soon as the agreement was signed, I became the back room staff and supported Martin McGuinness in the constituency. Um, then I was elected as a councillor, an MLA in the assembly, and, um, and then obviously I've been minister of different portfolios and now first minister elect. And I just, um, I think women have to see other women in leadership to be inspired and actually to come forward. And I'm very pleased to say that the change is immense in our society. Um, someone earlier referenced the fact that we do have uh, far more women elected uh, now, which is a really, really good thing. I think it's 36% in the assembly. Over half of my team are female. Um, that's something that I'm very proud of. Not to get complacent, but we have more to do. But when I look around me, um, no one would ever envisage that we would be in the scenario where we are today. Jane Brady is the head of the civil service, a female formidable leader also. Um, our attorney general is a female. Lord Chief Justice is a female. When you look across our society, women are leading the way. Um, but often it isn't spoken about enough. We don't celebrate it enough. So that's why platforms like this are so crucially important um, to be here. And women, I'm often for International Women's Day, you get asked the question, well, what do women bring? What's extra? What's over and above? And I just say everything. Everything. Because <laughs> it is true. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, we're going to bring the students in through some questions that I have from them here. And I'm going to ask the impossible of the panel to try to be brief <laughs> in the responses. Uh, so we have the first question here is from Katie Lambertius. She's in the School of Foreign Service. Her question is, and, and Monica, I think to direct this to you and Liz, how did gender dynamics impact the process of the peace negotiations? Is there a party or an actor in, in retrospect, you think would have benefited the process, the peace process today? It's a tough question and it, um, you know, I tried not to remember anymore the horrible parts of it. I tried to block it out and forget about it because that was then and this is now. And we have moved on and when I went to write my book, oh, there's a plug for my book, by the way. <laughs> um, I actually had to sit down and recall it. Um, and it was tough, it was hard. Um, but it was important not to forget that if you transform a society from conflict to peace, the transformation of those toxic masculinity attitudes has to change as well. Um, strangely enough, I'm going to speak about a man in the process because I think well, I've just been in South Sudan under a gum tree last week and I saw them role playing domestic violence and the men were doing their roles as what was once acceptable and what's now unacceptable. And I was just blown away by it. It was called Men for Women. There was um, a man in the process called David Irvine, a progressive unionist party. Um, and we became like brother and sister. And the day he died, I, at his funeral, his wife asked me to speak. And it was a great honor. And he spoke up for us. Um, he would have been affiliated to an armed group. And I recall saying, you are a gentle man. And I felt it was important for the men to speak out when we were being treated in a very derogatory fashion. And he did that. And for that, I remain very grateful. And I'm glad that I'm getting to mention him today um, because he was a great leader um, on the unionist side of the house. I came from the other side and he made me a much wiser person in terms of that dialogue. We initially had to enter a forum that was called the Forum for Dialogue and Understanding. And after the first day, I renamed it the Forum for Monologue and Misunderstanding. <laughs> so he made a difference. Liz? Um, I think, what, well, where I came from, I came from the women's movement. So it was always my view that our democracy is unfinished if women aren't at the table making policy, making decisions which influence everybody's lives. So for me, it was vital that... Uh, the Women's Coalition were there, as, along with other women who were involved in the parties through negotiations. And it was just luck, thank God, Mo Molan and myself were there representing the two governments. Uh, but that was just happens chance. You know, it wasn't, it, 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 was, it was luck, it really was luck. And 
I think what happened when the women's coalition came in, the language changed because they had different, uh, they had different set of skills and a different, uh, a different way of expressing themselves. And also, they were very helpful to the two governments as conduits because we they would fill us in and give us intelligence about sentiment in the community, which we wouldn't have had access to uh, go going through the traditional parties. Um, and I think they were pathfinders and they looked, they, they had a different agenda, looking forward towards human rights, reconciliation, the rights of victims, all of those things, because we were so busy trying to end the war and put in place a replacement for the Anglo-Irish Agreement. So, you know, the sort of the political end of things, that it was important that the Women's Coalition put on the agenda those, those issues of victims' rights and uh, reconciliation, integrated education, all of the sort of important things that make a peace endure, ultimately. We have a question now from uh, Dairi Ramirez. She's a government major in the college. And I'm gonna ask Michelle to uh, respond to this. What does the future of peace building and reconciliation look like? How can we all stay hopeful given the state of the world? I think hope's the biggest thing you can give anybody. I think that when we reflect on 1998, it was the hope that everybody grabbed onto. And I think that um, in, the, in a, the world that we live in today, who would have thought that we'd be back in a situation with Russia's invasion of Ukraine? Who would have thought that we would be sitting in this context today with that going on in the background? So the hope piece is crucially important. And I think in politics, it can be very, very challenging. There's a lot of negativity. There's a lot of you know thrust of debate, which is okay. But I think that I'm somebody that, that every day likes to practice that you need to give people something to hold on to. People need to know that you have their back and that you're going to try and do your very best for people. It doesn't always mean you get it right, but certainly that you're going to work really, really hard. So I think the, the hope, the optimism, certainly in our own context, um, whilst we'll reflect and we will, are, are reflecting on 25 years ago and the transformative piece and the journey that we've been on, for me very much this anniversary is about the next 25 years. And it's about that hope, optimism, it's about prosperity, it's about making sure that every single citizen feels that prosperity because it hasn't touched everybody. You know, that's the reality. The, the agreement hasn't, not everybody has felt the benefit. So we need to get right down into the heart of communities um, and make sure that everybody feels that, that benefit of, of peace, prosperity, and let's build. Because ultimately for people, it's about a roof over their head. It's money in their pocket. It's their education. It's the simple, it's the, the natural things, the everyday things that worry people. And I think that's the, the hope piece in all of that. Make government work. And we have a final question here for this panel from Clayton Kincaid in the School of Foreign Service. Mary, uh, following uh, Jacinda Ardern's recent resignation um, in New Zealand, and of course we could add Nicola Sturgeon to this uh, question, how can states ensure women leaders across the world are supported in the goals they're trying to achieve? That's an interesting question, Milan. We've gone beyond Northern Ireland now. <laughs> but um, uh, I know um, both Jacinda Ardern and Nicola Sturgeon. Actually, Nicola Sturgeon was at the Bellagio meeting that uh, uh, Hillary and herself um, organized um, uh, last, last May, was it? Um, and, and I remember she spoke there, Nicola, about how tough it is to be a leader for a considerable time um, in, in, a, in a country. She was quite open with us about the difficulty. I think. You know, in our world of 24-hour social media and the viciousness of the anonymity of the attacks, etc., we actually have to think a lot more about how to sustain really good women um, in office because um, those two women made a, you know, in New Zealand and in Scotland um, really made a, a, a very big... They were, they were leaders in, in the fullest sense. And the fact that they both... You know, spoke about uh, you know not having enough in the tank. Now was I think Jacinda's uh, expression, and, and Nicholas said something a little bit similar. Um, it, it shows that it's very wearing, and there clearly are not enough supports. And we have to think about the well-being of those also in high office. And I agree, just as you were saying about men should speak up in a Northern Ireland context. Men should speak up, you know, as well um, in, in this context. It. It, it, it's, um, it's very sad because we had all looked to those two women as part of the wider build-up of women at the table, women in leadership, etc. And I'd say it may be a little bit disconcerting for some younger women, you know, the way that 
you had your inspiration. Mm. You know, it, it, so I, I think we really need to think about this and make sure that the supports are there, that we are there for each other more. Um, you know, I think maybe even structurally we need to think about this. But I'm not, I'm not sure I could answer that question yeah. because we haven't got the answer yet. But it's a good question. But <laughs> one we have to work at. Well, let's thank this extraordinary <laughs> panel. Um, We're now so pleased to welcome the recently appointed U.S. Special Envoy to Northern Ireland for Economic Affairs, the Honorable Joseph Kennedy III, former member of Congress. He had a strong legislative record and will now bring his committed leadership on economic development and investment opportunities to Northern Ireland. Uh, so, Joe, thank you so much for being here, and please come on up. Like, if you had told me in the speaking program that I had to go after that, I just wouldn't have come. <laughs> um, so, Ambassador, thank you, I guess. Um, but truly, I am so honored and humbled to be on um, this stage after that extraordinary uh, group of leaders. Um, please. Thank you. I'm sure you all have heard this a number of times, um, but we could have listened to those stories for hours. Um, and to think that um, how many good things have come over a glass of tea or perhaps a bottle of wine, uh, but also relationships, right? And the relationships that you all have fostered um, that brought peace to so many. Um, and what a important lesson for all of us in any walk of life, in any place on this planet, to learn from that example. Um, so let me just say, Ambassador, thank you so much for your dedication, for your commitment to your decades of service, not just to our country, but to people all over the planet, but for you to be able to bring um, these leaders together in this moment. We are so grateful to you. Um, to the extraordinary dignitaries that are here, um, Ambassador Pierce, Ambassador Cronin, um, wonderful to see all of you for the fifth time today. Um, and it's, yeah, thank you, Consul General. It's not even 1130, um, <laughs> such as this week. Um, uh, Consul General, thank you for your, uh, your spot on remarks earlier uh, this morning as well. Um, and of course, um, to those panelists individually, um, thank you for your example, your commitment, um, and the leadership that you still exude, but the example that you will set for so many others, some in this room today. I'm truly grateful and honored. And of course, Madam Secretary, um, it is always a pleasure and honor to be with you. Um, we're grateful for your presence and your commitment and your service. Thank you. I'm looking forward to your remarks. So you all, we all have heard the extraordinary stories, legacy, and example that women have played in fighting for a critical and lasting peace, fighting for broader prosperity across communities in Northern Ireland woman that I wanted to highlight uh, that oftentimes gets overlooked. I'm, of course, remiss because she's now been highlighted four different times by the speakers, but um, I just wanted to point out that how many Americans shared a deep sadness with the passing of Baroness May Blood last, last October. Like John Hume, May was a stalwart for fairness and equality. Her early work in a linen mill framed her character and her conviction to fight for equality, integration, and critically as well, reconciliation. 
Women in those days, as we heard, were not expected to shake things up. But boy, did she. And I know that her influence stretched far across uh, Ireland, Northern Ireland, but here to Washington, D.C. And she never forgot her roots in Belfast. No one could doubt May's commitment to treating every human being with respect and dignity while providing opportunity for those who needed support. And that, in some ways, is what I believe my job as Special Envoy is all about, to ensure that economic opportunity that allows everyone to achieve respect and dignity. The late House Speaker Tip O'Neill, one of the acclaimed four horsemen, famously said that all politics is local. My great uncle, Senator Kennedy, another one of the four, had another way of looking at it. He said, all politics is personal. There's another corollary that I can add. All politics is economics. Because beyond securing basic civil and economic rights, the push and pull of parties and politicians is fundamentally about the division of wealth and economic opportunity in society. Where opportunity and prosperity abound, political divi divisions become smaller and less consequential. Lasting peace, then, depends on families believing in a better future. As First Minister O'Neill said, a roof over your head, food on your plate, your kids in a good school, a safe and secure retirement. These are not partisan issues. They are human ones. And that understanding as united peace builders before us, who knew that different as we may be, we all deserve dignity and merit grace. They recognize that while our future is unwritten, it is for certain to be shared. And that in this moment, uniquely this moment, we can choose to take advantage of the history that others before us have built for us to leverage. An anniversary that recognizes peace and stability, leadership on both sides of the Atlantic, unique opportunities afforded to Northern Ireland because of access to markets in the United Kingdom and in Europe. To combine those to build a future that is bigger and bolder and brighter. To make the case to businesses across the United States and around the world that highlight that investment opportunity in Northern Ireland is not just about contributing to peace and prosperity, although it is but it's also just flat out a good business idea. The United States is, in fact, Northern Ireland's largest source for market, uh, for market value foreign direct investment, predominantly technology, financial services, and professional services. We've created the highest number of total jobs and the greatest investment in Northern Ireland of any country since 2013. Over 12,600 jobs and 1.6 billion euros that have been invested in the local community. But there is so much more that can be done. And that is what the president has asked me to do, to recognize that the American public, all of you, American government, Secretary Clinton, President Clinton, and many others, have for decades bet on the people of Northern Ireland. We bet on the country of Northern Ireland. And we are going to re-up that bet once again, because we believe in you, we believe in their future, we believe in the opportunity of this moment. And so I wanna wrap by just letting you know how much it means to me to be here with all of you this week, spend some time with some old friends and some new ones, and recognize that the headlines that we read across newspapers in this country are in some ways not so different than the ones you might read coming from Belfast. Talks of division and differences, tension, debates, big decisions. 
But what we just heard is that critical reminder that there's so much more that we share than that separates. Madam Ambassador, Secretary Clinton, extraordinary panelists and leaders, thank you so much for reminding us of that fact again today and for guiding us to that future. Honored to be with you. Thank you, Envoy Kennedy, and all the best in your new position. It is now my pleasure to introduce someone you've already heard reference to, the head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service, Jane Brady. The first woman to hold this position, she was appointed in 2021 to lead a force of some 23,000 civil servants, and she's the chief policy advisor to the executive the head of civil service, she plays a very critical role in shaping public services in Northern Ireland. Jane. Thank you, Ambassador, and good morning, everyone. And I have to go next now after such a, such a lineup. I am so delighted to be here and it is such a pleasure and a privilege to be in a room so full of people of courage, imagination and enthusiasm for the place that we call home. And it's wonderful to be joined by our friends, in particular, Secretary Clinton, who supported our bravery and shared in our joy over 25 years ago. We are thankful for your ongoing support and for the support of those also standing with us on the verge of what feels like another special moment in our history. A moment underlined by President Biden's impending visit to Northern Ireland, reinforcing our deep bonds and bolstering our giant ambition, and of course, through the appointment of Special Envoy Kennedy. And of course, there are many not with us to whom we owe so much and who's recently been referenced, the late Baroness May Blood is amongst them. Reminiscing, May said, I've never known where it comes from, but I've always had the desire to change the world. I believe that somewhere, perhaps as mothers or as aunts or sisters, that desire to change the world resides in all women but too often our acts of courage and foresight go unrecognized. And as Monica will tell you, before the formal talks began in 1996, women were getting on with building the peace. And the evidence is clear, when women participate in peace negotiations, the resulting agreement is 64% less likely to fail and 35% more likely to last at least 15 years. And 25 years later, the peace these women helped to secure still holds. It has been so successful that we have become a model for other post-conflict societies. Northern Ireland has changed almost beyond recognition because peace has allowed us to flourish. It is a great place to live, to work, to study, to visit and to invest in and women are feeling those benefits. Northern Ireland has recently been ranked among the top nations and regions in the UK for women's employment outcomes. And we boast the smallest gender pay gap by a margin of almost 10%. Entrepreneurship among women more than double between 2019 and 2021, and one in every four self-employed persons is a woman. Women are undertaking leadership roles in business, politics, science and technology, shattering perceptions. I am so grateful for the brave men and women who have been part of driving that transformation in Northern Ireland and changing those outcomes. However, the job is not done. Despite these successes, as women, we continue to face obstacles at many levels 
and it feels at odds to speak of these challenges at an event which is reflecting how far we have come. But the post-conflict playing field was never going to be a level one. Similarly, the gender playing field is far from level. If our profound systemic issues in Northern Ireland are linked, and the evidence is they are, we need holistic, transformative and sustained change to help elevate women and all in society have not felt the benefits of peace. And I say that as a woman who has always been in the under 10% representation throughout my career. As a woman in engineering, as a venture capital partner, as a startup founder, and now as the first female head of the civil service in its 100 year history. And of course, policy is for ministers to decide and me to advise, but my advice is clear. We need to look beyond equality of opportunity to equity of opportunity and address the systemic issues which are stopping us delivering equality of outcomes. We need to tilt the playing field so that all of our society flourishes. We have world leading sectors, cyber security, software, fintech, life and health sciences, advanced manufacturing, but also the lowest female labour force participation rate of all nations and regions in the UK. Supporting these sectors to become more attractive to women will help to address skill shortages and boost Northern Ireland's productivity and competitiveness. To get there, we must challenge the significant and persistent underrepresentation of women at every stage of the in-demand science and technology skills pipeline. And we also need to repurpose jobs and reskill women to be part of the fourth industrial revolution. And this is an issue of equity, but is also holding back our economy. We can never achieve our full potential if we do not make best advantage of 50% of our talent assets and have all voices represented around all our tables. And we must end violence against women and girls, full stop. It creates insurmountable barriers to women's prosperity. And sadly, in Northern Ireland, we have one amongst the highest rates of femicide in Europe. The Northern Ireland's executive strategy to tackle violence against women and girls is in development, and we need all genders to join in implementing it it must be amongst the cornerstones of our transformation. And in this, the anniversary of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, we are at another inflection point of the place we can call home. We have the potential to take a different course and address the long-term systemic issues which are impacting us realizing our potential for the next 25 years. As Ambassador Verveer said, for me, leadership is making a difference. It's using your agency to bring about change. This room is full of global leaders, male and female, and collectively we have the potential to be the catalyst for that change as we look to the future and build the legacy for the next 25. Thank you. I'm going to ask Monica McWilliams to come back up here uh, to moderate a conversation among some elected officials and civil society leaders on implementing the Good Friday Agreement and sustaining the peace. So Monica, come on up, along with Emma Little Pengeli, a member of the Legislative Assembly of Northern Ireland, a barrister and member of the Democratic Unionist Party. Patricia O'Lynn also a member of the Legislative Assembly. She's a member of the Alliance Party. She holds a doctorate from Queen's University. Avila Kilmary, founding member of the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition, longtime community activist and peace builder. Among many positions, she was director of the Northern Ireland Voluntary Trust and today is with the Social Change Initiative. And Emma D'Souza, writer, campaigner, next generation peacemaker in Northern Ireland. 
She is co-chair and co-facilitator of Northern Ireland's Civil Initiative and a key, lead key leader of the first All-Island Women's Forum. Welcome all, Monica, it's all yours. Thank you, Madame. So I'll start with you, Emma. We're sitting here in Washington, D.C., surrounded by policy and decision makers. And as a leader yourself, how much resilience have you been able to build against the return of violence and political discord in Northern Ireland? And the second part of that is, what role can the United States and other partners play in the future of Northern Ireland? Two tough questions. Thank you. Um, firstly, can I say, just how incredibly lovely it is to be participating in this event and to be here today, where there's been so many strong female voices and female participants. I was going to say, it was also very kind to reach out and have some token men speaking <laughs> at the conference today, but I know that we appreciate their contribution as well. But I think it's also really humbling to, to, to follow um, what we've heard, and I hope it has been inspiring to everybody who is listening on. You know, I think for so many different generations of women you know, we were very much in the shadow of others. But I think for my generation, we're very much standing on the shoulders of the giants who went before us. And I think importantly, when we look across the panel here and the previous panel, it's not just in politics, it's in business, it's in the civil service, it's in civic society, where these incredible women um, really did build the peace, they maintained the peace. And, you know, I think very often we talk about resilience and our system, can be very, very difficult. You know, mm. I worked within the system really from 2007 as a special advisor behind the scenes. Like so many people who I think step forward into a political role have done so. Um, but yet, you know, when we look back and we look at all of those difficulties, you know, sometimes the criticism that we hear is about the absence, you know, this is a process which is about largely the absence of violence instead of what it has achieved. I disagree with that. But I would also appeal to everybody to say that the absence of that violence is nothing to be disregarded because, you know, I grew up in, in a small unionist town just on the outskirts of, of South Armagh um, in the 80s and into the 90s. And it was an incredibly frightening and violent place as a child and through the eyes of a child, not understanding perhaps the dynamics and the nuances of, of all of those issues. You know, what I saw, I saw the loss, I saw the violence, I saw the bomb scares. You know, I saw the women, you know, silently weeping while trying to hold it together and, and dealing with that loss. And they're still dealing with that loss today. And, you know, the absence of that fear, the absence of that violence is nothing to be disregarded. It's to be cherished. And it is incredible. And I think, to me, that is what motivates me. And when we talk about resilience, um, I think it's very difficult for, for women, particularly at the moment in, in public life. It always was. But because of the emergence of social media, the targeting of women, um, particularly on social media, I know in Northern Ireland and, and across, and I'm sure it's the same here in, in the States, that you know, there is this real deliberate attempt to bring women down. Um, I always said I, I was never called stupid more times until I got into a public political role where plenty of people, anonymous and many men on Twitter, constantly will tell you this. will tear you apart about your confidence, your clothes, what you do. Um, but you know, ultimately, um, you have that resilience because what we're doing is worth that. It's worth it because... You know, when I look at the new generation, and I now feel I was a teenager, um, 17, 18, in, in 1998. Um, but when I look at the new generation, they don't have that memory of that horrible fear and violence. Um, they don't have their friends who have lost their, 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 their fathers or, or brothers or uh, friends to that violence. And that is incredible. And that's why we have to fight to work to make this happen, to have that resilience and to keep persevering. Um, I think the second part of the question absolutely is about um, the, the role, I suppose, that the US uh, can play to support. And the very first time I was ever away from, um, from, from Northern Ireland, um, indeed, uh, out of the UK or Ireland, was to come to Washington as part of the Washington Ireland program, which you'll hear an awful lot about, um, now called uh, WIPS, uh, we call ourselves, but it was a young leaders program back then. And the, the current Taoiseach um, is a, a, an alumni from that, and there are many, many others, uh, of course, as well. But that was an incredible program. You know, we came over here, and, and I think the two things that really jumped out to me about that was the kindness and generosity of people here in D.C. that they showed to young kids like, like me um, from right across the community, from north and south. We, we lived with this amazing um, host family. 
we were welcomed in just like, like the children of the family. And, and it was the kindness at a time of difficulty and strife and, and, and still conflict, political conflict in Northern Ireland. Um, but that support throughout the years, you know, I would call out, and I think she is here today, but Carol Wheeler, who was very much associated with the programme. And, you know, throughout those years, and I know that she's done so to, to many people, she has reached out and given that word of encouragement, you know, as alumni, you know, as that cohort to say, you know, nobody can do things alone. You know, I think in our, our individual lives, we can't do things alone. But likewise, as politicians in Northern Ireland, we can't succeed to where we want to get to alone. We need that help and support. And I think the US is so critical to that. On that um, Washington Ireland program, I remember um, meeting with uh, Secretary Clinton uh, and she very kindly took time out. And it meant so much for, for us and, uh, as you know, kids that were 19, 20, 21. And it was the inspiration to that. But I think we've heard about how we want to move on from stabilizing the peace. And that still is a job of work to do, but to prosperity. We have to build that future for the next generation, happy, healthy lives, that they don't have the fear and the worries that we have. And we can only do that with the help and support, kindness that we have seen before, but indeed to move forward to the next 25 years of prosperity, we absolutely need to rely because, you know, you guys can open doors that we can't. And I know that we've deeply appreciated that support over the last 25 years, and I hope we will continue to do so. Thank you. Very much, Emma, and as the representative of the DUP, we wish you and your party um, all the best as you're heading into very difficult de decision-making time this month. And I hope your leadership helps to contribute to that as a woman. So thanks for that, and no doubt the training that you got here from the Washington Ireland Programme. We have another WIP <laughs> Washington Ireland Programme graduate, um, Tricia Lynn a recent MLA for the Alliance Party, Cross Community Party, um, is standing down at the end of this month, sadly. I think that's an important message also, Trish. Trish didn't want this to be made public, and it's probably the first time that I'll make it public. The old pocketbook takes a bit of a whack when the assembly isn't functioning. You've still your bills to pay. You've still a mortgage to pay. We still have our childcare to pay. As I knew the when it collapsed four times in that first assembly. So it's tough on women and men, and especially your generation, uh, looking at the bills coming in and your salary as a legislator going down and down. But that's not what you're here to talk about. You're here to talk about the young people and the emerging leaders of which you were one. You came off the Washington Ireland program. Um, what would you say to the young people listening um, who are getting a bit disillusioned and getting very frustrated with the slow progress. And perhaps the word we've heard this morning about reconciliation, how slow it has been to have a reconciled society. Tough questions. Um, tough questions, but delighted to be asked them and delighted to be here. So thank you so much, Monica Milan, and of course, Secretary Clinton as well. Um, what would I say to young people? I would repeat what was said to me in the Washington Ireland programme, which is be the change you want to see. And when you can't be that change, uh, find another avenue through which you can enact change that you will still want to see. Um, I think sometimes we're really good at pigeonholing certain people into uh, boxes or identities, but one of the thing that keeps me, things that keeps me energized and part of the reason why I'm stepping out of politics, temporarily maybe, but uh, stepping out of politics nonetheless, is, is to go back to the spaces where I feel energized and inspired to, to make change, and that's with young people. So I got involved in politics in 2016 as a result of being a whipper. I interned with Senator John McCain, and at the end of my internship, he pulled me to the side and said, what are you gonna do You know, when you return to Ireland? And I said, well, naively, very excitedly, me and my sister really wanna go to Ibiza. We're gonna go on holiday. <laughs> you know, there's really good DJs, and he just, he looked at me through a furrow brow, as he often did, and said, I don't think so. You'll be back here in a year's time. I want to hear that you've stepped forward into politics. And when you come back, then, you know, maybe think about that holiday to Ibiza. And when John McCain tells you to do something, you kind of do it. Um, but another motivation why I wanted to go into politics and relate to young people again is I uh, fell into really important work in school exclusion centres in Northern Ireland spaces where a whole cohort of Northern Irish society are left behind. Young people are either kicked or pushed out of the mainstream 
education center system and if they're lucky they make it into these centers the ones that aren't lucky slip through the gaps in the system and nine times die before the age of 30. Whenever I was running those services, I realized these young people need legislation, they need change, more importantly, they need their voices to be heard and they need to be told that they're worth something. Um, so that's another reason why I got into politics and that's somewhere that I'm gonna go now when I'm temporarily on leave from politics um, going forward. But Another thing just to say about Senator John McKee and the Washington Ireland program, and again in Washington DC, is that one of the things I learned from him, two of the things I learned from him was when to make an entrance and also to know when to leave. And for the reasons that you've highlighted, people think I'm just going off to do some great better job. That's not the truth, you know. There's no economic shock left in my, or shock absorption left in my family budget. And I'm not ashamed to say that because I come from what people would say is nothing. I say it's a whole lot and I'm gonna go back to it and I will be back if the opportunity is there to present and I'm gonna come back with the needs of or the interests of young people in hand too, so. Thank you, thank you very much for that. <laughs> Avila, you too have been described as a bridge builder. I have to declare a conflict of interest. I am the god mother to Avila's daughter who's sitting down there somewhere um, and we've been together for over 40 years and Avila was the co-founder of the Women's Coalition um, and a very strong civic society leader. How do you think drawing together the political, business and civil society leaders have been so important in sustaining peace and maybe even in speaking up over the last year in terms of some of the uncomfortable politics around Brexit? I think they've been crucial. And, and again, like was said earlier, they, they didn't come out of, out of nowhere. I mean, they have been active right through the years of the violence, as well as during the 90s, during the peace talks and, and, and after that. And one of the organizations actually that gets very little mention um, that was brought together by the Northern Ireland Council of Voluntary Action at the time was a thing called Concordia, which was the trade union leaders, it was the, the farmers association leaders, it was the employers, and it was the voluntary sector. And I always called them the cheerleaders for peace, right during the ups and downs of the peace negotiations, and there was as many downs as there was ups at the time, but also in fighting the referendum, because it was the yes campaign that actually mobilized, uh, apart from the individual political parties, the yes vote in the 1998 referenda, it, it, certainly in Northern Ireland, uh, and that was crucially important, um, because when we are noting, as, um, as, as, as Ambassador Milan said earlier, you know, the, 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 if you like, marking the Good Friday Agreement, I actually think what we really need to mark is those referenda, because that was where the people, both Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, said, yes, we want something different. So I think actually what would be really useful, I mean, when, when we are seeing the business leaders now speak, speaking a, a bit more about the the implications of the talks uh, over the implications of, the, of, of Brexit and the protocol and so forth. We also need to bring in back in the voluntary sector and the trade unions because, I mean, and uh, President Robinson mentioned people like Agnes McCormack, there was people like Terry Carlin, and, you know, the trade unions got out mass mobilisation at certain points during the trouble to say, this violence has, is going too far. And that did make a difference, I think, in terms of, you know, of setting the ground, if you like, for negotiations. But the other aspects of civil society are some of the, the courageous church people that actually facilitated those back-channel negotiations in Clonard Monastery and um, various, particularly Methodist uh, ministers and so forth. Again, that were crucial in actually doing the, re I always say, the research and development of peace building, because that quite often gets lost. And then the community movement that has been mentioned, the women's groups, and the community-based groups, because they're there where they can take the pulse points of both challenges and opportunities. And, and, and they can also sort of, they, they need their voice heard because we talk about societal change, but it doesn't affect everybody equally. And even if, you know, and, and, and Jane was quite right in terms of talking about peace and prosperity, but the very communities that were at the forefront of the violence and the, and the impact of the troubles, are still the communities that are actually suffering the most and where young people are most disillusioned. I mean, I work with the International Fund for Ireland and where we're funding some of those communities is where there, is, there has been growing questioning of what 
peace dividend? What peace dividend? You know, it hasn't made a huge difference to us. So again, it is really important that those that, that uh, within those communities that, that uh, are brought into the discussion. And also to recognize, you know, it's not plain sailing in those communities at the moment when we talk about the work still to be done. I mean, um, President Robson talked about the Windsor Women's Centre visiting it in 1992 and it had been burnt down. I, I got the phone call that Saturday where, from the, from the organisers saying, Avila, will you come over because we, we've just been burnt because we've hosted. And it was because the rumour was put around that community that the bouquet that was presented to President Robinson was white, orange, and then green leaves. And that that was, so that's the sort of level where, where local community activists are having to actually sort of, you know, uh, to, to navigate, if you like, what they can do with. And just this year, people in similar areas, women in similar areas, have been told, oh, now, you know, I wouldn't be taking money from the Irish government, you know. So again, you know, there isn't any sort of other programmes, very many, you know. So again, that sort of sense of control for party political reasons. And that's the thing that I think that civil society needs to start calling out and looking beyond at the moment. Because so much of party politics is short term and, you know, and, and trying to keep parties together or whatever in all different uh, jurisdictions. Whereas peace processes need people to be able to look around corners and look at the long term in order to create the space where we can actually create a better society, irrespective of what the, the constitutional arrangements are. Thank you. That's very important. <laughs> And I want to pay tribute to many of those who are taking the pulse. I know they're here. There are four or five women from the Shankill Road um, with Debbie Waters from Restorative Justice, um, somewhere down there. And many others who are turning corners. And I know that um, in honor of John and Pat Hume, that foundation is also working with young people and really important And the work you're doing, Avla on the International Fund for Ireland, and particularly around what Americans see first when they come to Belfast and other cities, is the peace walls. And as I said over and over again, not only do we work towards taking those down, but the walls in our heads as well. And it's Avila's responsibility under the International Fund for Ireland to ensure that we keep a date in mind to have every single last wall taken down. So uh, turning that corner, I like the idea that you look around the corner to see what comes next. Um, Emma, you're looking around the corner. Um, we have um, in the peace agreement, the Civic Forum, um, if it was to happen today, it would be a very different kind of forum. Um, and you've taken on the responsibility of seeing what kind of forum we should have. Um, what is your view on that forum in terms of the leaders that we would want for the future? Um, and how can you, we broaden the participation? Because a lot of focus is on the political parties. Um, and as you know, peace is built from the ground up also. So uh, the floor is yours in terms of telling us in this audience also the work you've been doing and how we see that as going forward. Thank you, Monica. Well, it's really an honor and a privilege to be on this stage and to be here today uh, with all of you. And um, I think that it's important to maybe reflect on the context of why we're trying to mobilize around civic society in Northern Ireland. And that comes from a place of recognizing that peace hasn't been felt evenly across communities. Uh, we have 600,000 people that have been born since 1998, growing up in a period of sustained peace, but in the same historical trappings as their parents and grandparents. We have 90% segregation in social housing, 93% segregation in our education system, over 100 peace walls remain, and a failure to deliver on socioeconomic commitments mean that we have a disproportionately high level of young people that actually leave Northern Ireland and the majority opt not to return. So I believe we need to do something to find pathways and solutions to push this stuff forward. It's been 25 years, and I think now my generation needs to stand up and say, we want to see a delivery. And so I think that we need to look at how we can find and create spaces to harness uh, ideas on how to move these things forward. Um, and within the uh, Good Friday Agreement, there is a commitment, a mechanism for a civic forum. It's meant to be a space to create a bridge between civic society and uh, our political leaders. It was actually a key demand, the Women's Coalition. 
and it was disbanded in 2002 and we never saw it again. And because of that, we have this real void of civic engagement, this void of civic spaces in a post-conflict society where there is so clearly a need to have greater citizen engagement to be able to give agency back to people in their communities, to be able to see themselves in the peace process and be able to have a say to push things forward. And actually, funnily enough, it was Avila Kilmurray, who I sat down with first around this idea, had a cup of coffee and said, why don't we just create this space ourselves? What are we waiting for? We're never gonna have it if we just continue to wait. And we need it. Civic society needs a space. It needs a space to critically analyze where we are with the peace process and to find pathways and solutions forward. And it always comes from the ground up. It always is in communities where we get these answers. We just don't have the right framework and structure to be able to harness them. And that's what we're trying to do now with the civic initiative. And in the space of a couple of weeks after we had that initial conversation, organization after organization committed themselves to this process because there is such an appetite and desire to try and get together and create a strong civic voice that can actually say this is our peace process and we want to move things forward. What we're doing now is we're trying to make this almost like a national dialogue, more expansive than the original concept that's more inclusive, more ambitious in its reach. We're trying to move it into community-based conversations, meeting with people in their communities to get them to engage on the process. Uh, and what we're examining specifically is rights, safeguards, and equality of opportunity under the Good Friday Agreement, the Declaration of Support. We're asking people, what are the barriers in your life and what do you think actually might need to change for it to get better? And I believe that that is going to be really critical because as you say, um, Avila, about the referendum, I too believe actually we really need to remember the people that voted for peace, that people took that enormous leap in 1998, and they are integral to moving this space forward, okay. and we need to get them re-engaged. Thank you. So, <laughs> so I too have some questions here, both from um, participants at Georgetown University, um, and I hope we can get to them, but for the sake of time, I might get through all of them. <laughs> But there is one that I'm constantly asked, and I'm sure you are too, that um, about the applicability of the Northern Ireland peace process. What lessons can be learned? I often say what mistakes can be learned, as well as the lessons um, from our peace agreement, uh, which could be put into practice. And one of the places that is on this card is Ukraine, which is close. I mean, I've just come from South Sudan, and they said that so much attention in the world has now turned to the Ukraine that they feel like a forgotten people. Um, but in our television screens every night we see this terrible war, and indeed, north and south, we are hosting over 48,000 families currently in such a small country. Um, indeed, one of those families is living in my own sister's home. Um, so, Avla or, and any of you feel contribute to this, because Avla, you have a foundation that brings other conflict societies together, but. What lessons or mistakes would come from Northern Ireland to other conflict regions? Well, the foundation you refer to as Foundations for Peace Network, which are locally based community foundations working in conflict areas uh, like Nepal and Sri Lanka and, and Georgia and so forth. Um, and I think marrying the learning from them as well as our own situation, I, th I think one of the geniuses actually of the Good Friday Agreement, um, well, there was, there was two ones that really struck me. One was the ability to untangle the absolutism of citizenship. So we can be British and Irish and both. And I, you know, and whenever, and we've both been in Cyprus, you're sort of saying, you know, in areas like that, that is really important. You know, it's not an absolutism that you're just Irish or you're just British or whatever, that you can actually draw the sort of commonalities, you know, of, and, and, and the best points, hopefully of different aspects of citizenship. Um, now, I think what we haven't done, and what has now been made almost like a, a win-loss situation, and so often politics in divided societies are, if that side gets something, then we automatically have loss, and vice versa, is identifying our, 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 our discussing even. So what does that mean? So what does that mean if we have constitutional change? What is, are the aspects that are, so, that are intrinsic to British identity that need to be, be respected and, and, and upheld. 
you know, in, in a different situation, or vice versa, Irish identity. So looking at having some of those conversations in a broader sense, and that could also be very important in a, in a, in a Ukrainian situation as well, you know, um, in fact, in any situation. And the other thing I think that we have learned, we haven't got round it in Northern Ireland, is to try and create space for diversity. So it's not, and I, I hate the terminology that's currently been used, Catholic nationalist republicanism or Protestant loyalist unionism. There's all sorts of differences within that. You know, there's, there's people whose primary identity within that might be LGBT or people that are incoming communities or whatever else. We need to create more space for people rather than sort of saying, well, the British people think this or the Irish people think that or whatever else. Because they actually, quite often what we find with opinion polls, you get 17% that actually do think that, 17% that think something totally opposite, and the people in the middles actually change, and, and depending on circumstances. So creating space for that sort of change. In terms, and you touched on it earlier, what did we do wrong? I think we all heaved a collective sigh of relief with the Good Friday Agreement being agreed, not quite signed, but agreed, and the, and the referenda, and we didn't look at implementation. Yeah. And I think, to be honest, you know, and we also didn't look at the, the, the implications of the renegotiation bits. I think of, uh, something that was really wrong was the St. Andrew's Agreement, where they reduced the representation for, from 108 people in the, in the Assembly to 90, which cut out people like David Irvine's party, the Progressive Unionist Party, the Ulster um, Democratic Party, that were so important to have there. So again, you know, having the eagle eye as to what's happening, and then also realizing that over time, and I really do pay tribute to the United States for its consistency of interest and attention in terms of the Good Friday Belfast Agreement and the Northern Ireland situation, because we're in danger in, in Britain, certainly and in Ireland, in the Republic of Ireland, of people just losing interest, done deal, and then and, and, and making, making uh, changes that don't take on board the, the, the intrinsic aspects of the agreement that then can perhaps start untangling it and, and, and um, be problematic. Thank you, Emma. Well, I think um, one of our biggest successes is also one of our failures, and we fail at it um, all of the time, and that is, you know, fundamentally as part of a trying to understand the other. Uh, and I think that what worked, or what appeared to work so well, I think back then, was a sense of, look, even if you don't agree with that person, you may not agree with me as a unionist about my unionism and why I think that's the best for the future of Northern Ireland. But it's the recognition that people have that view. And actually, I think in any negotiation, the negotiations I've seen that have been most successful has been when you recognize the fears, the aspirations, the hopes, the experience of the people across the table, but also recognizing the limitations that they also have. You know, there's no point demanding something in a negotiation which is completely unsellable for the other uh, parties that need to sign up to that. And I think likewise connected to that is the sense of, you know, any negotiation should be something that everybody can come away with and say, we've got a little bit of what we wanted. Nobody's ever going to get everything that they want out of a negotiation, but that there's no clear winners or losers. There's something in there that you wanted or you feel your community or who you're representing wants or is good for the future of Northern Ireland or whatever that may be. And that you can go out and say, look, this is a success, success because of this, but here's a challenge. And I think where we do it wrong at the moment, and I think this is something to do with as well, the emergence of social media. You know, we shout at each other in social media, you know, indignant in our righteousness and rightness and everybody else is wrong and we don't listen enough. And I feel, you know, especially as a unionist at the moment, you know, that there is an othering, you know, that somehow you're the strange creature that cannot be understood and yet, we have so much in common, our experiences, our hopes for Northern Ireland, or building the brighter future for our young people. There are so many things that we do have in common. And I think if we can get back to that sort of basic idea of understanding the aspirations, fears, and inspirations, and vision of the other people around the table, no matter what they are, a nationalist, unionist, or everything in between. And I think that is something that is applicable to conflicts throughout the world. I think Peter Robinson would often say, you sometimes have to make the issue bigger in order to find a solution. Because by making it bigger, there's more for people to get out of that. And there's also more that people can compromise on without absolutely compromising their key position and their ability to lead and sell and to promote that, that type of negotiated outcome. Wonderful. Absolutely from what I saw those years ago. 
So the EU and the UK have been in a bit of a struggle, Trish, Emma. Um, just just what the easy stuff for us. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of lessons of your experience of building sustainable peace? I mean, we've talked a lot about when you're in a crisis, get into a dialogue and don't get into a huff and don't walk away. Stay at it. Navalis talked about making difficult situations more nuanced. Um, that's a, a question and we're kind of getting through it. What's your sense? Will we get there? Yes, I think we will eventually. I don't think it'll be before I step down. I think it will be not too soon after and I think it's inevitable because if we know anything about Northern Ireland, it has to be governed locally and it has to be governed in the spirit of um, cohesion and togetherness. And what we also know, and I'm sure what Emma knows really well, because I've screamed about it enough on social media and in person, is that the middle ground is growing and my party's success is evidence of that. Um, we are operating in a political system, if you take the protocol aside, where you have to designate as nationalist or unionist in order to, to sign in. My party refuses, we designate as United Community. We don't have a view on the constitutional position. We're focused on the humanity of the situation, the bread and butter issues, the food on the table, the lights on, the kids going to school. And when it comes to issues of the protocol, how I managed it in my constituency, which for context, I joke fun and say it's the most liberal constituency in Northern Ireland. It's most famous for being the birth land of the DUP and um, Ian Paisley. And people think that it's some, uh, you know, non-cosmopolitan place, and it's not. The people are exceptionally kind. They're lovely, they have different views on the constitutional question to me, but how I, I built consensus, how I built relationships, and how I shared my perspective on Brexit was connecting with them about their children, about how their lives were being impacted, about how do we move forward? Is there any other way of moving forward other than negotiating this and getting our assembly back up and running? And the outcome of the election showed, no, there isn't. And I think that's why I got elected. But yeah, I think it's going to happen. It's just not going to happen immediately. Okay, that was a question from Fiora um, Adamina, who is a student here at Georgetown. So if you have time afterwards, we'll spend maybe the whole afternoon talking about the EU-UK uh, protocol, which we've been focusing on, but time's short. Um, Emma, last words. Um, you're a very young woman. You were nine years of age when the agreement was signed. Um, have you taken heart from what you've seen in terms of the role of women, women crossing the interfaces across community, of work that has been going on? Um, and would you get frustrated? That's a question from Tyler Heffern, who's a teaching assistant here at Georgetown University. Um, yeah, I mean, I was quite young when the agreement was signed, and if you had told me then that I would end up, uh, you know, defending that agreement through a court system for five years and it would become my life's work, I would not have believed it. Um, but it can be quite challenging, and I think on the point around implementation, I think um, being young at the time, I don't have memory of the Good Friday Agreement, uh, but I can look back and I can see what I believe are some of the challenges and why we're in the position we are now, and it comes down to that lack of an implementation strategy, and I think that in order to move things forward, uh, what I'd really like to see happen is three stages. One is a review process, uh, what has been implemented, what hasn't been implemented, does anything have to change? And I think we do have to be mature enough as a society to say, do you know what, some things that were necessary in 1998, maybe we've outgrown them. And I think as a second stage then, you also have to set up an implementation committee, and that should have US representatives, uh, British representatives, Irish representatives, and as a third stage, we need an external monitor. We know from other peace agreements that it is implementation where they falter, and this one is the exact same. So I think we really need to push that, that forward with that strategy. And just one final point around identity, if I can, because Avila was mentioning it, this um, practice of describing people in Northern Ireland as unionist or nationalist, or identities are far more nuanced and complicated and complex than that. I mean, there will be those who will call me a nationalist because I take a, take a position on the constitutional question, but I'm a feminist, an internationalist, a social democrat, and I think that these labels um, actually really kind of segregate us as a society. And a lot of people within my generation, we buck against that because our identities are much more than one thing. Thank you. And the person... <laughs> there is another woman who should have been on this platform, but she rang me the night before we were to take the flight to say she had COVID. Um, and her name is Sandra Peake and she runs the Trauma Centre for Victims and Survivors. 
And she asked me just to say a few words about what we're doing now in terms of the legacy of the past. And she is a true hero. She's been there. She's a nurse. And she nursed the victims of the Shankill bomb, the bomber, as well as the victims. Can you imagine how difficult that is? And that's what you do when you're a nurse. And she said, please tell them not to forget about the legacy and how we need to deal with that. And she wrote to me and she said, you know, we've now got this program of victims and survivors acting as citizen educators. So out of something terrible has come something good. Um, and I thought it was beautiful. And then she said, let's pay attention and tell the United States also and our people at home to pay attention to that legislation that's going through uh, Westminster. She said, it has to be human rights compliant. You cannot wipe victims off like this. She said, they have moved on, but please don't ask them to move aside. And that's really important message that we should leave the audience with. And I think we're still facing one of the oldest challenges. It remains the same challenge. How do we live well together? And that today, Milan, is what we've tried to do here and to show the people here in Washington, D.C. and beyond how we're struggling to live well together. But with women at the helm, we will never stop doing that. And it's with your leadership that we've truly been inspired and empowered and had our batteries recharged to go back and do it again. So thank you, Milan. Well, thank you to this remarkable panel. And I, I feel the word bridging again, the bridging of generations here, uh, looking at the challenges of today and also charting the future. I don't know of many people could, who could come up to this stage right now after everything we've heard, uh, hearing from so many really extraordinary individuals. Um, but I think you know who that person is. Uh, she needs no introduction. It is particularly fitting uh, to have Hillary Clinton with us today. She has, as you've heard, a longstanding connection with Northern Ireland and its people. For more than 25 years, I've witnessed firsthand the extent of her commitment to supporting peace in Northern Ireland as First Lady, as Senator, as Secretary of State, a commitment that continues today, and perhaps fittingly, that she is now the Chancellor at Queen's University, Secretary Clinton. Thank you. I am so deeply moved and grateful uh, that we could all experience uh, this program today. I start with great thanks to Georgetown President DeJoya, uh, to the Institute for Women, Peace, and Security, which has been truly transformational. Um, founded and led by uh, Ambassador Milan Revere. Much of what we heard uh, this morning from the speakers and the panelists uh, reflects the work of the Institute, how important it is uh, to include uh, the voices of all, but in particular to make an extra effort to include the voices of women. I wanna make just a few short points about maybe takeaways uh, that I certainly uh, will be thinking about uh, after today's. First, we heard the word relationship over and over again. And I can only emphasize how important it is to seek out and build relationships, particularly with people who may not at first blush agree with you but whose experience, whose voices, whose interests, whose fears and aspirations deserve to be heard. We have a lot of work to do in that area. Sometimes relationships are formed naturally. Um, I saw that firsthand all those years ago in Belfast when I began meeting with and listening to women who 
wanted to see the end of the violence, wanted something better for themselves and their family, uh, and who took great risks to build relationships with people from the other community, the other tradition. Monica reminded me that our mutual uh, friend, Joyce McCartan, who you heard earlier, had literally had her son shot uh, in their family home, lost a total of 13 family members. Think of the courage, commitment, and determination that it took for someone like Joyce to say, no, we have got to sit down, have that cup of tea or that glass of wine, try to find a peaceful way forward. Sometimes, though, relationships need to be um, organized and catalyzed. And many of the organizations that you've heard mentioned today, uh, you know, the Washington uh, Ireland Internship Project, where I was so pleased to have an intern every year I was in the Senate for eight years, um, or the American Ireland Fund, or the Fund for Ireland, and all of the groups, both inside Northern Ireland and outside, that were encouraged to keep looking for ways to bring people together. And as Mary Robinson uh, pointed out in her remarks, sometimes it started by inviting people to come from different perspectives to sit together and then reciprocating by going to them and beginning to listen and try to find a way to cooperate. I think we need that more than ever today. Um, we don't just need it in Northern Ireland. We need it uh, in our own country and in many places around the world. So value and nourish relationships and look for ways that organizations can be in the business of doing that. Secondly, it was important to be reminded of two things that are mutually reinforcing. One, uh, the absence of violence does not necessarily uh, lead to the kind of peace that you would hope for, but the absence of violence is a precondition to lead toward any kind of progress. And the violence that afflicted Northern Ireland for so many years uh, was an impediment to people's full potential, for them following their own dreams and understanding what was possible, not just for themselves, but for their families and their society. So first and foremost, we have to continue to prevent violence. And I think as we look toward the future of what will come next in Northern Ireland, there has to be a universal uh, commitment to that goal. Thirdly, in some ways, the negotiations for the Good Friday Agreement have to be viewed as, yes, a lesson to be learned about how to bring people together, but also a recognition of the many different attributes that individuals had to bring to that process. You know, George Mitchell is fond of saying uh, when he was helping to head the negotiations, and I think Martha Pope is here somewhere, um, that he had 700 bad days and one good day. And I can remember talking with him uh, during those 700 bad days. I don't remember the exact time frame, but it was probably a year before he could get people in the same room. And then when they were in the same room, they wouldn't talk directly to each other. George told me that he would have to be the translator even of people sitting finally on the opposite sides of the table. One would say, well, I don't agree with that, and I'm not going to talk about it right now. And there would not be a response until George said, he said, uh, he did not agree with that. The amount of patience that it took, not just for Senator Mitchell, but for everyone involved. Do we have that kind of patience today? 
the information ecosystem in which we live demands so much quick response, often totally unthought. It creates so much insulting, threatening rhetoric aimed at people who are trying to do hard things. If we were to start that negotiation today, what are the lessons we could learn from what went on before, but what would we have to do differently to reach success? And finally, you know, it took a lot of courage and risk taking to even jumpstart the process, to begin to sit and talk with people who you thought had, if not contributed to certainly condoned violence and disruption. I remember when my husband uh, issued the visa for Jerry Adams. Highly controversial, even within our own government. The State Department was against it. The British and the Irish governments were against it. But what was the alternative? To sit and keep talking? To keep reading about the bombings? To try to figure out some other way to get people to the table? You do not make peace with your friends. You do not negotiate with people you already agree with. It is sometimes difficult in today's environment for people to want to make the effort, let alone take the risk, to get out of their own comfort zones. We don't even want to hear things we disagree with. We don't want to hear different opinions from people who we have already concluded are outside the pale of our comfort zone. You cannot run a society, let alone make peace, for long if that is your ingoing attitude. I have nothing to learn from this person. I do not see him, her, as a fellow human being. There is no reason for us to talk. That is what we see happening in Ukraine today. The Russian aggression is aimed at dehumanizing the Ukrainian people. They are not worthy of existing, so why should anybody care whether they are bombed into oblivion? So we all have to do some serious soul searching about how we relate to one another in this much more complicated information environment where demonizing and scapegoating are just accepted strategies to get beyond that, to get back to the hard work of finding common ground and creating a more peaceful, prosperous future for everyone. So it's a great honor to have been a small part of this extraordinary journey that the people of Northern Ireland have been on. And we want you to know we stay with you, we support you, and we will try to learn the lessons that you have taught the rest of us. Thank you all very much. Secretary Clinton never disappoints. We have our call to action. And as she said, our journey continues. And that's true, this program has come to an end, but our journey together must continue. And before we all leave this room, let me just thank the people who made today happen. This was a very complicated program with more people on the stage than I think we've ever had speak. And we're grateful to each and every one of you uh, but it took a village, and let me thank our village leader, Jess Keller, Laura Kwan, Sarah Rutherford, Lexi Gobin, 
Colleen McMahon, Anna LaJava, Lena Torrijan, our colleagues from the protocol office and security, Mary Haynes, Jackson Menner. I want to thank Teresa Lohr for bringing a lot of the past forward here. And I want to thank Monica McWilliams because she has played such an indispensable role in the history of what we discussed today, continues committed going forward, but she also had a lot to do with this program. Thank you, Monica. So thank you all, and ever onward, our work continues.